There's a certain eloquence about Trinidad and Tobago that distinguishes the Twin Island state from its neighbors in the Caribbean archipelago. Consider homegrown steel band music, calypso and limbo, and an ample supply of the world's most beautiful women, juxtaposed with East Indian culture and oil. Trinidad and Tobago has no pair. Perhaps the most recognizable face this Twin Island Republic wears, though, is its unique version of Carnival. Trinidad and Tobago's inimitable mass, from the French masquerade, has become a peculiar catharsis for the nation's 1.2 million people. The two-day pre-Lenten Bacchanalian Rite is an annual event that allows the local gentry, and even tourists, to realize their pent-up fantasies in public. Notwithstanding the crowning of a king and queen of carnival, the central, indeed the most controversial character of this civilized madness, is designer Peter Minshall. Not surprisingly, a young Minshall took as his mentor George Bailey, a carnival legend and history buff now deceased. Bailey's historical themes in the 1950s and early 60s had earned him the sobriquet the Cecil B. DeMille of Trinidad Carnival. In 1963, Minshall was further inspired by an avant-garde costume, Beauty in Perpetuity, from the Bailey band, Bats and Clowns. Several years later, Minshall would recall this watershed era in mass and raise the Tinseltown image of the celebrations to a personal cerebral art form. He would paint his own broad canvas with bold satirical strokes and he would suffer the wrath of carnival traditionalists. In time though, he would prevail and his work would endure. Foreign magazines would ensure his continuing popularity. And it came to pass in 1983 that the old face of Carnival would don a new expressive mask. Moreover, the streets of Port of Spain, Trinidad's capital city, would become a Chekhovian stage. And a cast of thousands would literally play out the Anansi stories spun by an egocentric artist with a contradictory heart as large as the festival itself. Who is this man with a British accent braided with a Caribbean lilt? It might well be easier answering the question, what is the meaning of life? Forty-five-year-old Guyanese-born Peter Minchel grew up in Port of Spain, was graduated from London Central School of Art and Design in 1966, and thereafter created sets and costumes for a ballet theatre in Bristol. Became involved in the original Notting Hill Carnival in London in 1973, and taught drama at Dartmouth in the United States. In 1982, the Guggenheim Foundation awarded Minshall a fellowship for his carnival designs and costumes, an honor that also reflected his universal appeal. His greatest contributions awaited him back home, where a carnival of sexuality and sequins had mortgaged its soul over the years. He longed to be a mass man. His was a mission to lead a mass band down the streets and into the history books. First, he had to prove himself. From the land of the hummingbird, a prize-winning appearance by his foster sister Sherry Ann Guy in the 1974 Children's Carnival turned heads and boggled minds. He had put a body in a costume, made it dance, and called the creation sculpture. The performer had given it the power of communication, 
and the costume had become an art form of its own. Ironically, Minshall's insatiable appetite for surrealism drew raves from the public when he designed Milton's Paradise Lost as a carnival band in 1976. Winning best band title for band leader Stephen Lee Hyung, the presentation proved to Minshall that he too could create his own opportunities long before they had a chance to knock. Among a succession of controversial Minshall themes, Dance Macabre and Papillon offered a Fellini-esque view of life's absurdities, prompting the carnival community to reel with shock. This wasn't mass, or was it? It was Kenneth Burke who said, the most inventive satire is produced when the satirist knowingly takes serious risks and is not sure whether he'll be acclaimed or punished. For sure, Minshall lived such a dichotomy. But it was his belief that Though the audiences smiled wryly, they would admit eventually that the most dangerous animal ever lived is clearly ourselves. Thus was born the notion of the trilogy as a rakish adventure through mankind's landscape of survival. His commandment, thou shalt not rob the future, was Minshall's burning bush. Now he was ready for the ultimate challenge. The rivers of Trinidad and Tobago served as a compelling metaphor for the first of Minshall's dramas. With names like Carony, Santa Cruz, Oropooch and Capdeville, some 26 rivers reflecting a mosaic of Carib, French, Spanish, English, African and East Indian heritages provided a veritable fashion plate for the band's costumes. River street and stage performances on Carnival Monday were designed around the pristine condition of the birth of nature. It was an unprecedented choreography of colorless art. I think that in my heart, the most profound work that I have done in the mass shall remain the band River. As a work of art, it was searingly direct. It was, it was one of those times where the utter simplicity of it made it big, 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 big. And that in the mass, we should have had a living, moving, dancing canvas that was painted by the people on the streets. I think much of uh, my work in the mass and as I have matured within the mass and personally as a man, much of my work does deal with the the opposition of the forces of good and the forces of evil. I mean, one just has to look at the world today. One doesn't even have to look at the mass to see that opposition clearly working all around us. A story can be told in two sentences. A story in two, in two acts. Day one, which is the Monday mass. Here is the clean, pure, unpolluted river. Here is the virgin land. Here are the people living with the land and caring for it and there you had a canopy of white which symbolically joined the entire band together in a statement which did not even need to be said all are we as one from the beginning of the river to the end this one piece of white flowing cloth the soft sculpture that danced through the streets of port of spain around corners up and about and across the savannah and this these these noble natives of this land dressed in simple white cotton in the clothes of their forefathers led by a washerwoman her washing dancing in the breeze a washerwoman who banishes the threatening man crab who is the modern demon the demon the unleashed forces of technology now running ahead and man can't even catch up with it to control it and, and bring it back and, and, and set his planet in order
Rivers' impact on the color-conscious carnival machinery was initially felt, however, on the previous night. Occasion was the coronation of the King and Queen of Carnival at an outdoor arena in the heart of the city. Peter Samuel, Mincho's perennial king who had regaled audiences with the Devil Ray in 1979, Midnight Robber in 1980, and the Sacred and the Profane in 1982, numbed the senses in 1983 with his portrayal of Man Crab. Such a chilling display of creative gall marked the advent of a kinetic sculpture in Minshaw's war on commercial mass. The carnival had only just begun. Everybody asks what was Man Crab, what it was about. The whole thing is it was a machine, right? And only technological parts of man. What Peter was saying is, if you don't be careful with all this so-called, as I said, advancement, right? Okay, the performance of Man Crab on stage was, everybody wanted what the blood, what the significance of the blood, right? What he was showing is Man Crab, all his greed, just eating up everything around him, which is what's happening around us. Ends up killing himself, right? With wars and things like that. That's what Man Crab was about. We have had many kings in our production in the past. Man Crab, was a bit different. Different from the point of view that in previous years, we would build a king that is pretty, very effective, and expect a lot of applause. This time, Minch asked that we do something entirely different because of the theme then. The theme is man crab, really man's image, man's technology, man, weapons. Uh, this time he asked that um, in the costume we expect a different, um, entirely different than, than, than in the past, that we were hoping that the people, because, because it would be so grotesque that people, rather than applaud, will, will be happy if they, they boo. The head represent um, man's technology computerized. So it, it, it resembles a computer. Um, the, the poles that were keeping up the canopy were weapons. Um, the claws is, is usually done in a crab, but we put it up, up because we use the ends as uh, as blades really, swords or blades, whatever, however you want to see it. So that um, by turning it up, it is more effective. Um, <clears throat> it, it shows the computer aspect of man, his weapons, his, his, his sometimes very grotesque animal instinct in him. What he was saying is, if man is be careful, and it's right where he's going, he's leading to his own destruction. And that's man crab ended up coming off stage, de-gutting himself, with all the blood flowing and everything else. With Monday's celebration still burning on the memory, Tuesday's performance provided little relief from Minshall's seemingly endless human tableau. Tuesday presentation, Man Crab. Uh, there's, a, there's a funny kind of symbolism working there. Man Crab, the story goes. And this is, this is, this is all the plot that one needs to know. Man Crab, div using his finest technology, makes a rainbow of color. And he throws it into the river water. The rainbow of color from Man Crab, of course, are all those those um, technological benefits that we crave 
the motor car, the TV set, the fridge, little knowing that to get all of those things, some part of the planet has to be destroyed. And so, but that is man crab's rainbow, and of course the people go grab it. They go to the river with buckets of water, and they pour man crab's colors all over themselves. There's another interesting paradox here. I have heard just too many times now that carnival is color. Well, River had more color in it on that Tuesday than any carnival band has ever had. Yet the color was nasty. It was dirty. It was not at all pleasant. Everybody agreed that, but on the Monday it looked so nice. But on the Tuesday, so, so color per se is meaningless. Color can be as ugly as it can be pretty. There was a fight that went on for the people between man crab and washerwoman and then man crab killed washerwoman between the night and then going into the morning. That is when you saw me being carried, so I was dead. And man crab took over all the people and there was very few followers for washerwoman, right? And that is where you get all the colors on Carnival Tuesday. The fact that I was dead, no, it didn't bother me too much. At first I thought it was something funny to be dead and yet still be there for a But um, yes, I think it was a part of Carnival. Because you're telling the people what actually happened. So what, it's Carnival, big deal, but you're still telling a story. And it doesn't matter how you really tell it once it's being told. I believe that the trilogy, the intent and concept, was good. I believe it has no place in Carnival per se. If you were to think of Carnival as being something where people enjoy themselves, where there is gay abandon, where there is revelry, you cannot come to terms with the fact that what trilogy demonstrates or depicts or portrays that it is not congress with carnival as we know it. We need something where for two days at least we should forget our troubles, our domestic financial troubles, the world as it is for those two days. If a message such as the one that the trilogy intended to portray or portray, if such a mes message is to be portrayed, I believe there are other fora which this could be done have to be done very effectively because in essence the concept is good and I have no quarrel whatsoever with the creativity of Mr. Minister. In fact, my belief is that creativity is priceless but I believe that one must choose the correct forum on which one can portray a particular message. The message of doom and gloom is not intended for Canada. I cannot uh, conceive of a carnival season starting without uh, his detractors springing up like weeds all over again. But they're important. Um, they, the, their, their importance, I believe, allows Minchel to express himself. And uh, the, the, the depth at which he speaks at times, um, I think is due to the fact that there are people who uh, attempt to define carnival. The problem with all of this, which makes it meaningless in terms of its, uh, of its um, validity, is that carnival cannot be defined. Uh, carnival is like an ex exquisite piece of chinaware that shatters on the ground. And uh, you can look at it and you can see the pieces of its brilliance, of its, of its form, and yet you know that you cannot put it together, you can never put it together. Carnival is the same way. Uh, you cannot define carnival, you cannot put it together. You have to, to experience uh, people in their, in their expression of democracy to, to, to love carnival, to be part of that.
If River was a universal plea to mankind astride his technological monster, to pull on the reins and forestall impending doom, the story of Kalalu, the trilogy's second work, was an audacious allegorical statement on the creation. With Man Crab as Satan, Washerwoman as the Virgin Mary, Kalalu of course as Christ, and his disciples calling themselves Moon People, indeed the players all depicted an abstract lunar quality using the circle as a unifying element, little wonder this band proved even harder to digest as mass and fun than its predecessor. In the case of Kalalu, where, I mean, of course, Kalalu means so much to all of us. And here again, and of course, he's, his, throughout his work, it's so heavy with symbolisms. You have Kalalu, which means so much to all of us. Um, we, even the, the, the physical mixture of Kalalu, that, so, so, so within that is embedded the whole concept of unity. And then he takes a, a Kalalu leaf, which he says is heart-shaped. Now, I don't know if you'd noticed that before, but I certainly had never noticed that the Kalalu mm -hmm. leaf was heart-shaped. And to use that as a symbol of love and unity, and to use the play upon the, the inherent force of carnival as a unifying, as this unifying force, and to use that to say we are people who, are, who represent all different racial and ethnic groups, and therefore we should mix up. And that, and that to mix up means that we can then combine our various spirits, our powers, and um, through that fight the external powers that threaten us. Kalalu developed the river theme and, and broadened it somewhat from purely ecological concerns into the, the basic problem uh, as faced by the world today, the simplicity, the, the brother loves brother, the, the, the togetherness of man in, face, in, in the face of a possible nuclear holocaust. Uh, man crab, um, having defeated Washerwoman, finds that her son, who is the son of love, an every man, mm -hmm. he is not black, white, green, or blue. He, he is every man. He is the symbol of man's love for man. It is the one thing that man crab now has to defeat, to, 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 to find total power. And to defeat um, um, the son of Washerwoman, who is every man, man crab, uh, sires, a daughter with the help of science and he names her Hiroshima. At the Sunday Evening King competition, Samuel showed that he could dance on water as well while ratcheting designing techniques and masquerading moves to a seemingly unattainable level of fine art and non parai respect. Topping off the structure with a mirrored African headpiece, he called the presentation Kalalu Dancing Tic-Tac-Toe Down the River. It was the lightest costume I've ever carried. It was not the easiest costume to carry, but it was the lightest by far. Because it was just basic, as I said, pong wise, pong for, it was about 40 pounds, if that much. It felt more like that because it was strapped onto my feet, so it restricted the movement, but weight wise, it was the lightest costume I've ever carried. Materials, strictly fiberglass, um, plastic netting, and Roscoe paper. The cost of the costume can vary anything. I mean, I could, I could safely say one of my cheapest costumes would have been about four or $5,000. But the most expensive would have been about $30,000. So they vary, right? Peter has been known to produce a very large, cheap king costume, which is very hard to do. Cost-wise, I don't put out any money personally. The committee, the band committee, they pay for the costumes. Peter Mitchell does the designs. We do the building, the manufacturing of the costume. Whatever prize money we win, we share between us. But the prize money you get for the time and effort and money you put out is, I would say, one eighth of what you put out. So anybody who really, anybody from any band who plays king or queen, they do it strictly for the love of it. There's no money making in king or queen. 
the Queen contest provided drama of a different sort. Coelho's, I've seen the bird of paradise. She has spread herself before me and I shall never be the same again. A quotation from British writer R. D. Lang ensured a double victory for Minchel on Carnival Sunday. When we started out, well, we did fishing pole rods, which is fiberglass. And you have to weigh each one because not each one is the same weight on line. So when they did that, they got my weight against that. And then they used silk material, which is very, very light. So that wasn't very much. And all the different fiberglass pieces. Well, everything, you know, just fitted in. But that was the main part of it, the weight of that. Because um, my backpack, which they make, that is not very heavy. It has to be able to take the weight of everything else, but it's not, it's not very, very heavy. Minshall employed the same creative device with Callaloo as he'd done with River, forbidding his Monday masqueraders to prematurely sully his snow-white canvas. The Children of the Moon are celebrating Callaloo's victory over Mancrab in a festival of love and togetherness. Mancrab's colors have faded. The river runs clear once more, clear and pure as the people's hearts. Washerwoman has resurrected as a bird of fire from the sun, from paradise, a spirit of pure burning goodness, leading a band of innocents, a band of little children who are the love and hope for the future. Callaloo the son of washerwoman and Papa Bois is the eternal symbol of man's oneness with nature. He is man's love for man and man's love for the planet Earth, man's birthplace. He is the conscious power of love in the universe. Kalalu is the alter ego to man crab. Kalalu's communion with nature is so close. His inheritance from Papa Bois is so powerful that as a sign to man, as proof of man's extraordinary potential and the power of love, he is able to walk on water. During the festival of love and togetherness, the people prepare a sweet Callaloo stew with all its many ingredients which is served in every household, bringing diversity into togetherness all over the land. The Callaloo of man is as sweet as the stew. The differences are there to delight, not to divide and destroy. To celebrate Callaloo's great victory, the people have built an effigy of man crab, a boboli, exact in every respect to the original, which they send up in smoke. They dance and they sing in praise of Kalalu, in praise of peace and love. They call themselves by the names of their songs and their dances and by the names of their musical instruments. The true spirit of the people has been uncovered by Kalalu. There are circles around heads everywhere glowing auras, halos of light and love. With so much spirit, with so many circles abounding, a greater spirit and a greater all-encompassing circle is made, which joins every heart in the land to every other heart, every hand to every other hand, every man to every man. But all is not as well as might seem. At the very end of the celebration, Madame Hiroshima arrives. She is the daughter of Mancrab, made with science. She is a terrible warning for tomorrow. On Tuesday, Minchel allow the crowd to color its evil ways on stage. Madame Hiroshima has tempted Kalalu and failed. She offers absolute power, but he only wants love. Mancrab's fury is unimaginable when he hears of his daughter's defeat by the son of Papa Bois. He decides to send for help from his demon ancestors, the seven deadly sins. Mancrab's ancestors advise him that in order to conquer Kalalu, he must first of all conquer man. Hiroshima must tempt man, not Kalalu. When man falls, Kalalu will fall. Kalalu will die from sadness of heart. The seven deadly sins promise to assist Madame Hiroshima by attacking man at his very center, corrupting him from within.
from the inside out, not from the outside in. This plan works like a breeze. Man is completely overcome by the power which Hiroshima offers. Kalalu's heart grows sad. The sadness brings him close to death. He can no longer dance. He can hardly even stand. But stand he must. He must not fall. If Kalalu falls, then love and life, everything that man holds dear and sacred, man himself and the whole earth, everything falls. Kalalu must not fall. The people are totally possessed by the seven deadly sins. Man craves power and longs for the company of Hiroshima. Man crab's colors have grown bright again. This is the kingdom of hell. There is a great parade of power and strength through the city. Huge totems to the seven deadly sins are fashioned from bamboo, bush and rope and pushed along the streets. Envy, anger, pride, lust, gluttony and greed are given worship and full praise and last in the parade is sloth. In an ironic twist, a technological glitch in each of his demonic totems called the seven deadly sins triggered mass confusion at the moment of Minshul's glory. The problem we had on the day on Carnival Tuesday with these seven deadly sins, with the die is that the, uh, the, what they didn't foresee was after let's say half an hour of spraying the dye, the dye started clogging the nozzles. They were using ordinary garden hose and they were using a water pump to pump the dye from the tank through the hose. But the paint, they were using a mixture of a water soluble paint and dye. And after a couple of minutes, it started to clog the nozzles. So the dye wasn't spraying as far as they expected it to. And they had a lot of problems on stage because they tried it out before for two, three minutes, and it worked beautifully. They started on stage, it started working, and after about 15, 20 minutes, everything just clogged up. So. The people, ambivalent as ever, still worship their totems and Kalalu still suffers. Only man's love for man and the earth will ease the sadness in Kalalu's heart and make him strong again. Only man's love will save man. The theme that, that runs throughout his work is evil versus good. Uh, th there's that, that constant conflict of evil versus good. Um, which is, is very, very germane to our society, particularly at, at this point. Um, you have to understand too that he's doing this in, the, in that period, and in this period of, um, of oil wealth, and we're moving into, we, we, we're in a transition stage of you don't know what, well, we didn't know what at, at that time, now we know. Um, but I, he could foresee, as anyone you know, with, with some good sense could foresee, that the kind of, of challenges we had to face ahead. And I think what he's saying is that we need to go back and look and, look and dig deeply into our cultural selves and hang on to that, because that is, that is a good solid base that we have. And in addition to that, he's also saying that we are, a, we are from a small island, uh, but we can use what we have here um, as a model for you know, and relating that to, of course, the external, um, the external situation. Um, I think that Mr. Minchel, in fairness to him, explained um, in one of his um, one of his promotions that what happened on stage was not was not um, was not orchestrated by him. It was done. It was done in a gay abandoned by the players. And it turned out that way. There's nothing wrong with this, right? I'm saying that in that 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 carnival must not be orchestrated in the way where a, where a band of people have to do a certain thing because of a particular type of mass that they are they are playing. I, I I'm totally against that sort of thing.
Papillon uh, represented an opportunity um, using the butterfly as a form and yet making a very deep uh, statement about society. The butterfly catcher or catchers that we played also represented that in that we, my buddy played in khaki and I played in all white. Um, and he carried the butterfly in a jar and I carried a huge net, huge red net. Um, and we bought two, what is called, what we know in Trinidad as cork hats in Barbados. And I played in a white cork hat, uh, white tall socks, white pants and shirt, and he played in all khaki. And uh, we felt that the, the catcher was a catcher alive, uh, trying to snuff life out and at the same time snuff it sufficiently so that it can be maintained so people can see the beauty of past life. And that was our part in it. When Minshall saw us on Monday, he was aghast. He felt that we had tampered in a way with his presentation. Um, and uh, he carried a, a certain uh, distance from us uh, for a couple of years. And for, he felt that we were really um, the uh, vagabonds of the band that um, on, on either day we would add something to his to his mass a comma a full stop an exclamation mark to the to, to what his costume was all about and, and uh, so we would do something to it a mass band is about the closest thing I know that that, that in terms of visual expression is the closest thing that comes to the abstractness of symphonic music. It is, it, it is at one and the same time a progressive experience from the viewer's point of view. There is a beginning, a middle and an end. There is also, if you are happily positioned, the advantage of seeing the mass approaching in its serried ranks. It's incredible. There's that total whole. There are the many parts. And within the many parts, there are even more parts. There are characters that lead sections, and then section leaders, and then the floor members. There is the balancing off, as one does with music, there is the balancing off with this arrangement of color, shade, tone, and form with that arrangement. There is a totality where the very first person to come into view is connected up by all the thousands in between with the very last person that passes from view. It is an extraordinary cinematic, it's funny that I have to use words like cinematic, symphonic experience and yet it happens in visual terms its great beauty is that it is live there is this enormous rush of live energy at the retina and at the emotions This is the final part of the whole story. Um, this final part has to do with positive and negative, good and evil, yin and yang. As far as the, the mass is concerned, what is new in this mass is that almost the whole band is plastic. There is so much that one can say um, in a carnival band. And Concurrent with the band, there was a, there was a lot that, that, that was bouncing around in me that I that, that needed to get out. And so as part of that presentation, or accompanying it, um, I wrote a little folk fable. Um, 
And in the fable, I spoke of a golden calabash, which is like a holy grail. It's a source of power. Mm -hmm. It is an indiscriminate source. Whoever has the calabash or drinks from it mm -hmm. is immediately empowered, uh, whether they be good or evil. The name of the entire presentation is the golden calabash. Princes of darkness, led by a prince of darkness, and the lords of light, led by a lord of light. These two bands are coming out on the road to compete with their mass and how they play it, to compete before the judges and the people, to see who will win. Minchel doesn't decide, the judges do, and the people do. The people who played the mass simply responded to, to the message that the actual mass had in it. I saw a man with a pair of wings there, and he was taking his wings and bowing them to the ground and lifting them back up. Never a word passed between me and that man, but he understood his mass, and so he went out to play it. If Minjul's mood was dark with Kalalu, it went into total eclipse with Golden Calabash. Calabash was a distillation of all his presentations to date. A sort of ghost of Minchel's past, if you will. Although Minchel put a mirror to our face so that we could choose between the dark and the light size of our humanity, the overriding effect of Calabash was one of apocalyptic horror. When in the golden calabash. I create an abominable creature called the Adoration of Hiroshima. I do so in the sincere belief that this island and these people in expressing themselves say something meaningful and important to their brothers all over this troubled world. People say that carnival is not that carnival is uh, is not theater and that it's it's he's playing an intellectual mass and all of that that is not really understanding the, the, the function of art as, as a protest and, and, and Minchel I see use, using ritual as protest and art as protest and rebellion. Um, what I find um, very, very encouraging and inspiring and about Minchel is the fact that he is using these indigenous um, folk, you know, culture uh, which unfortunately we have gone away from in the post-independence period and for, for a number of reasons uh, largely also the bombardment with the with foreign values and foreign heroes we are people that um, have been looking for our own philosophy our own ideology for for many years and uh, Minshel uh, has presented uh, to the society that opportunity to identify with uh, a, 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 a touch of life that um, is both dear to the masquerader and uh, dear to the person who feels that uh, he wants to stay on the side and look at Minchel perform. I played Minchel because Minchel speaks to me and uh, in mass and in terms of philosophy that um, teaches my, my son and his friends uh, what Trinidad has been and what Trinidad will be in the future. I think it's only now that it's gone that it's having an effect on the public. 
And when he first came out to that, I don't think they really understood what he was trying to say, where he was coming from. What he said, he didn't enjoy. Same nonsense again. It was like going back to Papillon. Everybody looked at Papillon as a bunch of butterflies. It took them out three, four years to realize what he was really saying. It's the same thing with the river. Right? It took them at least two, three years of as the story progressed to understand what he was saying two years ago. So I think it's only like last year people started to realize what he was saying, where he was coming from. I think the book he wrote on it helped a lot. I can't see that, you know, if everyone decides to go like him, what carnival would we have? You know, a macabre, a drab carnival. It was very nice indeed. It was a very good experience to work with Minchal. It is one of the things I will never forget. Minchal, uh, theatric. I don't think it's a theatrical move anyway, you know. I think that's been in carnival a long, long time. Rubber man, they stand up and make his speech, and Indian. When a man playing Indian and he stop, he say, Ute, Ute, Randan, Mi Akan, Pistole, Pistole, Dai, 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 Scannival. Finally, it may be a bit early for an artist of Minchel's inordinate wit and creative resourcefulness to bequeath a legacy to his followers. But, would you know, the old Minch never lacked for words. The great poet playwright, Frederico Garcia Lorca, pretty well sums it up for all artists. The poem, the song, the picture are only water drawn from the well of the people. And it should be given back to them in a cup of beauty so that they can drink and in drinking understand themselves. As with the poem, the song and the picture, so with the mass.